worried about how to make the transition into renewable energy when uh, electric vehicles are powered by coal-fired power plants. But Alan, you've done that. It is a piece of the tapestry of uh, alternative energy, renewable energy. And Indiana's role has been significant, and it started 100 years ago. I'm going to talk about how that happened and how some of the people collaborated to do that and how we must continue to collaborate to keep it important in the future. And I, my uh, little slogan's been, it's electricity, Stu, but I stole that from uh, President Clinton when he said, what's important in politics? It's the economy, stupid. Well, what's important in automotive powertrains is electricity. It is electricity, stupid. And that's where Indiana excels. Um, it started 100 years ago when there was no electricity on the car. It's hard to imagine that, but the cars, uh, the headlights on cars were powered by compressed acetylene gas. And that compressed acetylene gas was supplied by a company called Prestolite, which was the most profitable company in Indianapolis 100 years ago, owned by James Allison and Carl Fisher. And um, it, it was a pretty exciting time. Uh, acetylene is a very dangerous gas. And uh, the factories that made this compressed uh, acetylene, which were in downtown Indianapolis, kept exploding. And on the third explosion, it blew part of St. Vincent Hospital away. And the city said, you guys got to get out of here. So they moved way out in the country to Speedway. And that's what kind of connected uh, Allison and Fisher with the Speedway area. In that area, the uh, acetylene lights, the canister, was good for about 40 miles at night. If you drove at night, the range of a car was 40 miles. Um, the magneto, there was a little bit of electricity in the magneto, but the magnetos had problems at low speeds, so some of the cars had battery ignition, and the, battery was, the batteries were dry cells. And those dry cells were good for about 200 miles. So the range of a car was someplace in the 40 to 200 mile range, and then you had to stop and, and do something. Well, in 1911, Charles Kettering in uh, Dayton, Ohio, invented what I'll call the SLI system, the starting, lighting, and ignition system. He put a generator on the car for the first time on the 1912 Cadillac. So now you could generate electricity wherever you went. And you could store it in a battery, and you could bring it back for a lot of purposes, including starting the vehicle. And it, it is, is what made the car um, really the desirable uh, vehicle that it is today, that everybody can drive a car. And the, the, in that range, they had the initially about 300 watts was the generator. And then in later years, not just recently, two kilowatts or maybe two and a half kilowatts. That's what you had. And you could power a lot of things on the vehicle, but you couldn't turn the wheels. In 1996, the, the, the world of EVs and hybrids started. GM introduced the EV1, the powertrain for which was developed here in Indianapolis. And uh, a year later, Toyota introduced the uh, Prius, and, uh, and then on and on and on. Now you have EVs and hybrids that have from 50 to 250 kilowatts on board. And that provides enough power for tractive effort. You can turn the wheels. And we start from today and go forward. We're going to have EVs. We're going to have plug-in hybrids. We're going to have smart grids, sustainable communities, lots of power. Once you plug all these vehicles into the utility grid, they become part of the utility system, and that's a whole new, new subject for the forum in the future. Now, these uh, pre-1911, uh, 1909, 1911 were critical years. The introduction of the uh, Kettering technology uh, obsoleted Prestolite's acetylene lights and Remy's Magneto business. So uh, Jim Allison and Carl Fisher sold their business to Union Carbide, whose interest in bottled gases was different from cars, as we know, in later years. Allison took his money, and he started a company called Allison Engineering. 
which is one of the reasons we're kind of in a leadership position today, because Allison Engineering became Allison Gas Turbine, Allison Engines, Allison Transmission, Detroit Diesel Allison, and all of the Allisons that we know about. Carl Fisher took his money and started a town called Miami Beach. And then he started a highway from Chicago to Miami Beach called the Dixie Highway. The Remy brothers were kind of threatened, so they sold out. And they sold out to Stoughton Fletcher, who was a banker here in Indianapolis. Fletcher Bank, Fletcher National Bank, AFNB, Bank One, Chase. This guy was Chase in, in those years. He brought in a Purdue professor called John Esterline, and Esterline developed an SLI system for Remy. And uh, about five years later, uh, he, Fisher, or, uh, Fletcher sold Remy to Willie Durant, who was putting GM together. Now, these dollars I've got on here are in today's dollars. So Remy sold to Fletcher for $20 million in today's dollars. And Fletcher sold to Willie Durant for $200 million five years later. Durant then purchased Delco, uh, Delco, the Dayton Engineering Laboratories Company, from Kettering, and he formed Delco Remy in Anderson, which became, I'll say, the intel of the day. The key invention of this, area, of this era was the Kettering SLI system. And there was a cloud of people that, that formed to develop these businesses. It says here. So who were these people? Well, uh, I mentioned Durant, Fletcher, Allison, Carl Fisher. Frank Wheeler was a carburetor guy, had a company that made carburetors. Uh, Arthur Newby started the Diamond Chain Company. Marshall Taylor, the highest paid athlete of the day, maybe ever. Louis Chevrolet, Charles Kettering, the Ball Brothers, Fred Duesenberg, Harry Stutz, Orville Wright, Wilbur Wright, Frank and Perry Remy. All of those people were in their 20s and 30s at the time. And the common interest of that group was bicycle racing. It is hard to imagine now, but before cars, there were bikes. And the high-tech sport was bicycle racing. Uh, I've under, I heard that Madison Square Garden was built in New York to be a velodrome for bicycle racing originally. And actually the fastest track was right here in Indianapolis. 